over the past two years, I have been astounded and not in a good way by the anger, the, the vitriol, the hatred, the prejudice that I have heard on the news from the White House in Facebook posts and, and written in blogs, overheard in conversations. It has really gotten to me. And it breaks my heart to see people who claim the label Christian, who continue to give in. And they sacrifice their integrity and their morality to take a stand on worldly things and refuse to change their opinion even when new information comes to light. See, I've seen families torn apart, friendships ended, because we've become so prone to shout our opinions, but we are slow to listen. We're quick to judge and think of our responses, but we refuse to hear the words of others around us. See, we're, we're so quick to take a stand and prove that, that we're right and to continue to hold on to our beliefs, our values, our, our perspectives, regardless of what else comes, that we lash out at others. We refuse to hear what they have to say. We're more concerned with being right than we are with being loving. And when we go down this path, pain comes. And it's not just a mild discomfort that I've seen in our nation in this past year. It is deep, deep wounds, sorrow and anguish, deep grief. And the more our nation, our church, our community continues to go down this path, the more isolated and alone we'll feel. We'll be in our own little tribe, refusing to hear or associate with anyone else. It just gets worse and worse. And we get to this point where it seems like everything is careening out of control and there is no one to comfort us. Nothing that helps make us feel any better. It seems like things are, are out of God's hands. And all of a sudden, those, those small voices coming from culture start to sound a little bit louder. Why do you believe in these fairy tales about God? How can you continue to believe in God? If there was a God, things certainly wouldn't be going the way they are. Men like those who have been in power wouldn't be allowed in power. Things like the, the hashtag Me Too movement wouldn't have existed because people wouldn't have ignored what those women said. Things wouldn't be the way they are. The stones that are getting thrown start to hit us a little bit harder. The wounds get a little bit deeper. We start to look around and everything feels out of control. It feels like a complete mess. And then we hear today's passage in Isaiah 40 and we wonder, what does Isaiah have to speak to us? So we need to go back a few verses. Because in Isaiah 39, Isaiah comes into the king's palace. And he comes to King Hezekiah and he says, God's not going to deliver you this time. Things are a complete mess, but Israel is going to be taken into exile. People from your own family are going to be made eunuchs in King Babylon's court. The people of Israel are going to be led away in chains as slaves. God isn't going to deliver you this time. He's going to let you face the consequences of your sins. He has sent prophet after prophet, but you refused to repent and listen. And so now God is going to, going to let the nation state of Israel in the Old Testament come to an end. This is the beginning of the end for what you know. But it's a new beginning. God isn't going to abandon his people forever. Well, the people of Israel in those days, as they were being led away in exile, surely wondered, how could it have come to this? How could God forsake us? What hope is there for salvation when all of this has happened? They have this, this brokenness, wondering what comfort is there for us in these times? 
Likewise, sometimes today we, we wonder what comfort, what hope is there for us here? The prophets in the Old Testament had something to say to us. They, they understood how we felt. Listen to the words of the preacher in Ecclesiastes 4. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. Or from Jeremiah in Lamentations chapter 1, after Israel has just fallen, they've been taken into exile. She has none to comfort her. All of her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is none to comfort her. They heard my groaning, and yet there is no one to comfort me. Through Isaiah, we know why this has happened, why God allowed it to happen, why God allowed the people to go into exile. This was to drive them to repentance, and so that through repentance, they might find healing and comfort, mercy from God. Now, I'm not trying to tell you why things are happening the way they are in our culture, in our community, in our nation, or world today. I don't have that answer. But I do know that God always longs for his people to repent and turn back to him. He always wants us to step out of the darkness and into his marvelous light, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 2. God longs for us to come to him. And so God uses pain and discomfort as smelling salts to wake us up to the reality around us so that we might refocus on the important things, on the eternal things. See, God allows pain and injustice, suffering and brokenness to come so that we we might be driven back to him so that we might be prepared to receive the eternal blessings of God once again. I Isaiah talks about this. In Isaiah chapter 12, the end of the, the sort of first section of Isaiah, as God has told him what's going to happen throughout the rest of his ministry, Isaiah says, In that day you will say, I give thanks to the Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger has turned away that you might comfort me. That we might be restored and comforted by God. The pain, the, the suffering, the brokenness ran deep for Israel. And it runs deep in our lives. Uh, we all have those places where brokenness pervades in, in, our, in our daily lives. Where we feel, when we feel alone and isolated, that's when we need to hear the beautiful words of the messenger in Isaiah 40 once again. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Our need for comfort is desperate. But even more so is God's desire to comfort his people. To bring comfort to you and me. See, God longs to come near to us. To draw near to us. To lift us up, restore us. And, and to care for us just as a shepherd tends to his flock. See, though, though we may be in desperate circumstances, though the pain may be deep, there is still hope. Because our God isn't a distant God. He is a God who comes near to us. When I'm speaking about this part of the gospel, I like to use the image of the manger to help talk about this. It's a reminder that Jesus, in Jesus, God is the God who is with us, who comes right near to us to be with us in the midst of wherever we are. So despite the, the brokenness, the pain, the ugliness of this world, Jesus was born into a lowly manger, a feeding trough. He didn't think he was, it was above him to be near to us. And so he's not above coming in to the messes of our lives, to the mess of broken human drama, of the things that you're going through. He is promised to be right there. See, where, where sin runs deep, God's grace runs deeper. Where brokenness is wide, God's love is wider. Why? Verse 1 of today's passage tells us. Because we are his people and he is our God. He's your God. He's the God who is for us. Who is on our side. To the point of, of Isaiah 40, if you break it down, the, the point of Isaiah 40 is this. That despite appearances and frustrations, God is for us and God is with us. So Jesus is the God who stepped down from his heavenly throne, took on frail, vulnerable flesh, became a servant, lowered himself, and became one of us so that he could tend to his flock, his sheep, with his grace and his mercy, so that he could bring comfort to you and me, his people. 
to the end of the story for the people of Israel is that God did eventually come and bring them, to them deliverance through the Persian Empire. They were restored and brought back to the nation of Israel. But that wasn't all that God was promising in Isaiah. See, they still had to deal with sin, with brokenness, with suffering. They were still suffering the consequences. They still had the pain and the misery around them. God had promised something deeper. And likewise, you and I, we, we still suffer from the anger, the vitriol, the hatred. We see it in our culture. But this passage in the Old Testament was pointing to what God was going to do in Jesus Christ. How Jesus would come. And by his presence, by his presence, he would be near us. He would say that God is not far off, not distant, but right there with you. And that Jesus, through his work on the cross, would bring you pardon for your sins and your iniquities. That God would cover your shame and your guilt. But this story also looks forward. It looks forward to something else coming. That Jesus was going to come again, and he will come again. As the true king, wearing the crown as Lord of heaven and earth and of all history. To bring to fulfillment all of those promises that God has laid out in, in Isaiah. He is going to come to shepherd his people. To bring the hope, the love, the joy, the peace that we talk about so often in Advent. He's going to make that a present reality for you and for me. So God comes and he draws us into his arms. And he gives us comfort by his power, by his presence, by his pardon for our lives. Amen.